All right, continuing on with non-parametric uh, distributions or non-parametric null distributions, uh, we're now going to see how to correct for multiple comparisons using the max t distribution. Make sure you're ready for this. Do you already know what the max t is? And are you super comfortable with permutation tests? If not, please revisit the parametric approaches for controlling family-wise error rate part two and non-parametric hypothesis testing, the last one, the permutation test overview. Again, uh, parametric methods assume some known distribution. Um, for this is, I guess, for controlling the family-wise error rate. Um, so of the max statistics. So we looked at this before. We had a parametric distribution that was based on the Euler characteristic. Non-parametric methods can also be used, but we're going to use our data to find the distribution of the max statistic. And again, you can use any max st statistic. It doesn't have to be a T. Um, it could be a mean or whatever. It doesn't matter. We're going to be using a T in the illustration later. And then, as usual, once you have your distribution, you find the threshold associated with the 5% upper tail probability, and then you apply that threshold to your data. So, first things first, we need to collect a max distribution, and we use that to find the threshold that controls our family-wise error rate. And another consideration with imaging data is to consider using a smooth variance image to compute your t-statistic. And this helps low regularize our variance estimate if it's noisy. So, I'll show an example of that in a second. If you're like, what? Um, you'll, see, you'll see why smoothing helps. So how do you do this? The first time I saw these steps, it kind of blew my mind. So fasten your seatbelts. So the first thing you do is you compute your statistics map for your original data. That's not the mind blowing part. Then you shuffle your labels just as I showed last time. So if it's something like a two sample t-test, you say two groups, uh, you shuffle the group labels. If it's a one sample t-test, you randomly multiply your values by a one or a negative one. Um, if it's a correlation, you just randomly shuffle your data, um, usually the regressor, the data in your regressor. Then, this is the part that kind of blew my mind, you compute your map of statistics and then you just take the biggest one. So you take the voxel with the largest statistic and you save that number. Um, so you have 200,000 statistics, but you're just gonna take the biggest one. And then you repeat steps two through three many times, maybe 5,000 to 10,000, and you use this, these 10,000 max T statistics or whatever your statistic is to construct your null distribution. Um, importantly, it doesn't matter that the max is obviously going to move around the brain for different permutations, and that doesn't matter at all. And then we use the distribution of our statistics over our permutations to compute the threshold, as I've been showing with that cartoon example. And then we apply that threshold to the original map from step one. So this is a voxel-wise approach. We'll talk about cluster, too. So here it is, applied voxel-wise. Um, and this is what I was referring to earlier as the variance distributions noisy. So we've seen these before, these uh, kinds of plots. So it's a single slice of data and the topological plot is just uh, the t-statistics. The so you compute the mean difference if you're doing a uh, two-sample two t-test and you divide that by the square root of the variance as we do. But you'll see the variance is much noisier, it's much more jagged looking than the mean difference. And that's just simply because um, small sample sizes, you're going to have noisy estimates. So then what happens is your t-statistic tends to be a little jagged. But if we smooth the variance estimate prior to computing our statistic, obviously that's going to make our t-statistic a little smoother. So this helps because we're choosing the max, right? So if we're working off this thing, I mean here there's a clear max in this, this example, but we want to make sure that max wasn't just some noise due to this noisy variance image. So smoothing can help. So here's an example with real data. Um, there, this is a working memory task. There were 12 subjects. It's a block design. Um, it's item recognition. So either in the active um, case, the view 
five letters is a two second pause. And then they're shown a probe letter, letter and they have to respond yes or no, meaning did, did this letter occur in the previous image. Baseline is just a bunch of X's and there's a Y or N and you just match, you know, no for N, Y for yes, or yes for Y. So this is the second level random effects analysis. The difference image A minus B is constructed. So you could think of this as a one sample t-test of the differences, which is equivalent, we all know, to a paired t-test. So that is our model. So what would be permuted is randomly choosing subjects and multiplying their A minus B contrast by a one or a negative one. So there are two to the 12th permutations, so plenty, um, well, more than 20, right? So this is, this is okay, around 4,000. 96 ways to flip the AB labels there because there are two choices for each subject, each of the 12 subjects, uh, plus one or minus one. And then for each one, you compute your one sample t-test on the whole brain, grab the biggest statistic, save it, and then you can construct using those 4,096 values, this distribution. And you find the threshold that gives you a 0.05 upper tail probability. And then you apply that threshold to your original statistic map, that's the last step, and you get this. So you can see, this is, these are actually the same data I was showing you with the um, uh, random field theory lecture that only had five active voxels. Well, you can see we're doing much better here with our permutation test. Oh, yes, here it is. So, and, so this is what I just showed you. This is what we saw before. This is using either random field theory, voxel-wise, remember, random field theory, or the Bonferroni threshold. And you can see that when we smooth that variance estimate, and a variance estimate with 12 subjects, that is gonna be pretty, uh, pretty noisy, right? It's not a lot of subjects to estimate a variance. Um, but you can see that smoothing the variance estimate, it's giving us a much nicer null distribution and our uh, results look better. So it kind of it stabilizes the result. So random field theory threshold is too conservative. The data aren't smooth enough or the degrees of freedom are too small. Permutation test is more efficient than Bonferroni because it accounts for the smoothness, right? So you can think of this as... Um, Right, since it's looking at the data, the inherent smoothness of the data just builds itself into the null distribution. And the smooth variance version, this lower left-hand corner, is more efficient for small degrees of freedom. Obviously, if you have a really large sample size, your variance estimates will be much smoother. They're only noisy because the, because the sample size is so small. So I'm now going to do a MATLAB demo. So this code, you can get it online. Um, we're going to assume simulated data. Um, there are 15 ROIs. For each ROI, we're looking at the hypothesis test for the overall mean over 20 measures, or 20 subjects, I should say. So we could use a Bonferroni, but maybe we'd be better off using a permutation test. I should warn you, these are simulated data, so, um, uh, so, so they're independent. So if it comes out like Bonferroni, don't be surprised. All right. Doesn't matter. This code, by the way, you can reuse this code if you run ROI analyses. The reason I even have this code is because I've done this for people. They come to me, they're like, I have 15 ROIs and the p-value for my one, one ROI is 0.04. It's like, oh no, like, I don't know how I feel about that. And what makes me feel better is, because obviously if I do a Bonferroni correction on 15 ROIs, it's gonna kill that 0.04, right? So and my option to not just, just rain on people's parades is to then code up something like this and use the max T statistic instead of Bonferroni. This will be less conservative. Um, so you will have this code and you can do this as well. And I would highly recommend it. It'll actually imp likely improve your results. Um, anyway, that said, if your result already survives a Bonferroni correction, don't bother. It's not gonna uh, change much. Significant is significant. So the first step, calculate your test statistics for all 15 tests without the use of permutations. Step two, randomly select some observations, multiply some of their values by a negative one because this is a one sample t-test. So if the null were true, the sign 
isn't important. Then we're going to calculate our 15 test statistics. Our multiple comparison problem is over these 15 tests, and we're only going to, whoops, 12. Uh, save the biggest one. Then we're going to repeat two and three many, many times. We're actually going to do, yeah, we'll do 5,000. And then last, we compare the original test statistic from step one to the cutoff corresponding to the 95th percentile, the max T distribution. Um, actually, I'm just going to compute the p-value for each one. So obviously change this to the path on your computer that leads to the fake data. And first step, calculate the 15 T statistics. I, let's look at the dimension. Oops, I can tell I use R most of the time. So we have, it's 20 by 15, so there are 20 subjects, 15 ROIs. So to compute my 15 test statistics, I'm gonna take the mean and the standard deviation, and then the t-statistic is going to be the square root of 20 times the mean divided by the standard deviation, just your typical t-statistic. And then I get the original p-value. So this would be a per comparison error rate p-value by simply comparing it to the uh, t-distribution with 19 degrees of freedom. So this is, I'm just doing a one-sided test, not a two-sided test. So. Look at our p-values uncorrected. So yeah, a couple significant ones in here. And a couple that are kind of on the edge. So I would worry about you. You're definitely no good. Um, you're definitely no good. So we wanna know about these other ones though. So here is steps two, three, and four. So I'm going to do 5,000 permutations, so t max is going to be where I store my maximum t statistic. Here I'm going to randomly flip the sign by using ran sample, sample 20 values, true means uh, sample with replacement. Then I'm going to multiply, uh, creating a matrix, that's what this is. Um, here, let me just run this one so you can see what this is because it might not be clear. So random. Flip is just going to be a vectors of ve vector of ones and minus one, 20 of them. And random flip mat is going to be a matrix where each column contains those flipping, whether or not to flip. That's so I can do an element-wise multiplication by the original data to get my permuted data. And then I compute the mean and standard deviation now for each, again, for each column and I get my 20 T statistics. Then I just take the biggest one. This makes it really clear what it's doing. So, run that. Then the last step, what I'm gonna do is for each of my original T statistics, I'm gonna loop through my 15 um, ROIs. Hold on. I made a mistake up here. Yes, no, that's correct. Sorry, okay. For each of my ROIs, I'm going to compute the p-value, which is simply how many values in my max distribution are greater than or equal to that t-statistic. So I'm gonna sum that divided by the number of permutations. Alternatively, I could have just taken the mean of this vector. So I'm gonna do that and then compare it to the original. So you can see on the left, these are the uh, original p-values and these are the permutation p-values. So you can see in all cases, the p-value will increase, but the question is whether that increase took it above 0.05, and in some cases it did. So this result went away, uh, this result went away, as did this one, you get the idea. So you're gonna lose some of your results, but some of them will be preserved. Um, last, I'm just simply going to compare uh, the per, per comparison error rate to bomb Veroni and permutation tests. Since in this case the voxels were independent, I actually get similar rates. This is, um, let's see, this one here is the permutation-based result. How many, it's just a count of how many tests were significant. 
this is how many were significant with Bonferroni, and this is how many were significant with per comparison error rate. Um, in this case, Bonferroni is matching uh, the max T based on the permutation test simply because my ROIs were independent. If you want, you can go through and create, you can generate your own fake correlated data and rerun this, and you will see that this will actually be bigger than Bonferroni. So that's a fun exercise for you. Um, hopefully you think so. I think it's fun. Um, you should do it. All right, that's a MATLAB demo. The cluster statistics, it's, it's just slightly different um, because we need to create clusters. So it's a two-step process. First, you have to define clusters by some arbitrary threshold, u -clust, so this is review. And then you define your clusters, right? So we have two clusters here, one here, one here. Um, and then in this case, the cluster statistic is simply how many voxels are in the cluster. Um, and then you come up with a cluster size threshold. And if it's smaller than that threshold, it's not significant. If it's larger, it is. So you can do this very easily with a permutation test as well. Uh, you can use cluster size where you simply count how many voxels are in your, uh, I said statistic, it's in the cluster, or cluster map mass, which is the sum of the statistics in the cluster. So it takes into account uh, two pieces of information. So cluster mass is uh, somewhat more intuitive. So this kind of equates a extended low level activation with a really focal high level activation. Um, and cluster mass is difficult to compute p-values for using random field theory. This is the only one. It, it exists. I know papers have been written on it, but um, it's not implemented anywhere. The cluster size is for random field theory, but it looks super easy with permutation test. There's another approach called TFCE, which I will do a paper overview on. So how you do this, you find your clusters with your original data and your cluster forming threshold, permute the labels, and, and you count how big they are or your mass, compute your statistics, apply your cluster forming threshold, Compute your cluster statistics on your permuted uh, data statistics and save the largest whatever cluster size or cluster mass and repeat steps two, not two through three, sorry, so co copy and paste. It would be steps two through six many, many times. And then you would use the distribution from step seven to find a cluster size or mass threshold and you apply that to step one. So you'll find when you do this and randomize uh, in FSL, it creates uh, a thresholded um, map for you. And it's really, it's discerning that you get one p-value for the whole cluster. I kind of like that because if that's if you use cluster mass or cluster size, it really drives on home that you really just accepted or rejected the null for the whole voxel. It is an omnibus test. TFCE gives you voxel-wise statistics. And again, stay tuned. I'm definitely going to cover that. Ooh, got that. This one's a little long. It's unavoidable. Um, why don't permutation tests alone fix multiple comparisons? That's really important. I've seen people simply code up a permutation test and say, I did it. I fixed my multiple comparison problem, but it doesn't necessarily. What did we need to use to address the multiple comparisons? And how are the voxel-wise and cluster-wise permutation tests set up? So make sure you can wrap your head around that. Thank you very much. Please join the Facebook group and have a nice day.